Ever since I was a kid, things have been happening to me. Strange. Strange things have been happening to me. I just never really figured out how to talk about it. I'm filming a documentary. I'm using GoPros, iPhones, and tiny medical cameras. I'm gonna find out who's been behind those tinted windows in my neighborhood. Okay, three tries. My bigger plan is to let everybody see what's been going on. This will explain everything. Hi everyone, Simon Foster here, Festival Director of the Sydney Science Fiction Film Festival. I'm very excited to finally talk to Mr. Patrick Donnelly, Director of The Alien Report, which is coming to our festival around the country in a week or so time. Um, great to have you here on the YouTube channel, Patrick, and congratulations on the film. Thank you so much for having me. We're really excited to show it in Sydney. Um, we have a close connection to Australia because some of this, a lot of the star footage we used in the movie is from uh, an astronomer, uh, amateur astronomer in Australia that we got hooked up with through YouTube, you know. We're a talented bunch down here. We really are. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's do this thing where we, where we sell the film a bit. Give us Alien Report 101. What, what's it about for those who are, who are just coming to it fresh? You know, when we first were making the movie, just by random luck, we got uh, a meeting with a film company in Los Angeles. We were there for like two days. And there was a notable film company who we sat down with all these executives and we thought, we're on our way, you know? <laughs> and they said, tell us what the Alien Report is about because they saw a little bit of you know test footage that we did. Yep. And I go, yeah, it's this kid, he's recording his alien abductions and you see everything. And they go, and what's the movie about? And I go, <laughs> I go, what else is there to say? Exactly. You know? And the meeting didn't go well because I had never been in a pitch meeting before, you know? And when I get, and when we got out of the meeting, I was with my buddy who helped me film it. His name's Kevin Schroeder and he was the DP on it. And he goes, dude, why didn't you tell them the story of what the alien report's about? And I go like, what? Like, it's this troubled teen who's like, you know, abducted his entire life, and he decides to finally hide a, a hidden camera inside of his cochlear implant, and he wants to show the world, you know, his actual alien encounters, and he chases the men in black, and he covers, he covers himself with tiny GoPro cameras, and he goes after the cars, and it's his struggle, you know, because no one's going to believe him, so he, he, he's going to show footage of the men in black and interactions with an alien hybrid girl. And like, I told, and I told my friend Kevin, I'm like, what, is that what they wanted? And he goes, dude, yes. Yeah, of course he's like, that's, that's what they wanted. They, yeah, he's like, that's what they wanted to hear, you know? Uh, but it's a good pitch. It's I, a solid pitch. I'd have made the movie. Why wouldn't you? That's great. I know. I was learning, you know? <laughs> but I mean, it's essentially, we thought, you know, we. I was a big fan of sci-fi, you know? I love sci-fi. And whenever I see movies like Contact or Arrival, you know, some really like high, you know, budget movies, 
I, I always go, why don't they just show the aliens, mm. you know? I'm like, and why don't they tell the real alien story instead of showing octopuses? Because, um, you know, when people say that there's no proof and we don't know what's flying these UFOs, I sort of scratch my head and go, wait a minute, isn't there a lot of proof? Isn't there like a lot of drawings and like firsthand accounts of people that supposedly have met these things? And isn't there like sculptures that have been made? And, you know, I, like to me, when we were researching it, I was overwhelmed with the amount of, I mean, you know, not proof like someone landing on a lawn and saying, hey, we're the aliens. Yeah. But, I mean, as far as proof goes, I think there's like more proof of, supposed proof of, of alien encounters throughout history and, and, and more recently than, you know, of, of just about anything else you can name. Yeah, exactly right. And you're certainly preaching to the converted here. I'm, I'm on the record as being an absolute ufo alien abduction nut so um i absolutely soaked up all the elements of this film let me just touch on and it sort of wears that found footage label but i guess because of the aesthetic and the the uh, the handheld footage and that sort of stuff that that's a big part of it but i think it's a it's a deeper sort of construct than that isn't it like it's how do you how do you how would you describe the filming style and, and the genre that it maybe fits into it's funny because i didn't no, we were making a found footage movie. No, exactly, yeah. And and when we got done with it, people kept, you know, like the first people we started screening it with were saying, hey, this is a found footage movie. And I'm like, no, no one found the footage. Mm, yeah, exactly. And and I'm like, it's not a found footage, you know, but it is a found footage. <laughs> it's a found footage in the sense that, you know, it's like, it's a POV selfie movie. It's, it's it appears to be, um, it's it's that genre of, you know, like, you know, like the Blair Witch was self-recorded and Paranormal Activity was self-recorded. And I just, in my ignorance, didn't know. I thought found footage was like the whole pitch on someone finds it and then turns it in. And now you're seeing like, you know, the actors are dead or gone. And, um, but it is that, you know, I just didn't know we were making that. It's but a spin on that, I guess you could say. It's a spin on that. I, you know, what really got me was we didn't have any money to make this movie. Um, you know, we had zero budget. I was saving up for a truck. And so I'd saved like a used truck. For, I'd saved like $30,000. And one day my wife goes, hey, you going to get that truck? And I go, no, I'm going to make a movie about alien abductions. And she's like, you idiot. <laughs> and I thought, I thought for the money, you know, like I, like I work in the film business, you know, uh, uh, I've worked in it my whole life, you know, working on film sets and, you know, making TV commercials and all this stuff. And I thought it would be really interesting to see a movie where it is a selfie, you know, with the, with the advent of uh, YouTube and TikTok and everyone recording their own selfie videos. I thought, what if some kid covered himself in GoPros and little like hidden cameras in his hearing aid and, you know, just surrounded himself with all these little uh, micro cameras, which shoot in HD, you know, like you get, you know, uh, 1080 out of these tiny little pinhole cameras. Mm. And I thought, wouldn't that be cool if he figured out a clever way to disguise these cameras and then record his own alien encounters? And I thought that would be a really fun way to present the UFO story, you know? And chasing the men in black, you know, like covering his bicycle and GoPros and like going after these tripped out cool black cars, you know? I thought that would be a really fun way, you know, to, to so that it was realistic and not like blockbustery and cinematic mm. but rather you know like bring the audience right into the scene you know like bam you're in the scene because it's like all over his body you know yeah, fully immersive and it is it's, it's had a long production history though now further full disclosure and i'm being very open about this i saw a version of it uh, maybe 18 months ago maybe a bit more and it's, it's gone through different iterations over time tell us tell us that uh, some aspects of that long production history um I had an opportunity to talk to a guy named Eduardo Sanchez who made the Blair Witch. Yeah. He got, he actually answers emails. I couldn't believe it. And I was looking for some advice on how to cut this thing together. Not that he watched it, but we talked about his movie and he said, man, he goes, I just kept screening it with friends and at little festivals and kept editing it and editing it and editing it. And he goes, and people will complain about scenes. And then I would pull those scenes out. Like anything that no one liked, I pulled right out. And he said, and it went from something that was unwatchable to all of a sudden it's in Sundance. Mm. And however he said that, it struck a chord with me because we were having the same issue. Our, you know, for a good year while we were doing the visual effects, 
you know, there's 38 scenes with like, you know, a thousand layers of visual effects in each of these special, you know, these alien encounter scenes. And so there was a lot of green screen, but we were, I was showing it to people and, um, you know, people would say, oh, I like that really scene, but that scene, you know, where he's talking about how we're all just a bunch of ducks, which isn't in the movie, uh, they're like, yeah, that scene really sucks. And so I just, I grab, when I talked to that guy, Eduardo Sanchez, I suddenly, you know, I listened to his advice and I just started pulling out, you know, the movie was two and a half or three hours. It's down to 80 minutes now. Yeah. And I pulled out every single scene, every, even if I thought they were cool, I pulled out every single one that anyone complained about. And so, yeah, it spent, it spent 18 months in uh, editorial, but mostly because it took a long time to finish, finish the visual effects. It was just myself and another guy. Mm. And if we had had a warehouse full of visual effects people, we could have cranked this baby out in like six months, <laughs> you know, but that wasn't the case. We never, we never found funding. We never found help. And we just started, you know, slowly doing scene by scene and testing it out. So you probably saw uh, an early version yeah. of the movie. Yeah. But that, how's that for a long answer? to That's a great answer. Um, as I mentioned, the whole UFO alien abduction um, uh, lore is, is something that I'm fascinated in. And, and you work it all into this film. There, as you mentioned, there's the, the, the men in black, there's the hybrids, the implants. There's also that the emotional aspect, that mix of fear, but also attraction that a lot of abductees talk about. And um the the uh impregnation of of uh the human hybrid aliens um so this is all stuff that's familiar to me having been a, a nut since i was 10 years old um but is this something that you have always been fascinated by this kind of detail in the in the alien abduction story i think let's see a good answer to that question is i have a grandfather who's no longer with us but uh, he was he worked for the government and he was from Scranton, Pennsylvania, and he was a very serious guy. You know, uh, he hung out with all the local judges and all the, the police chiefs, and we have a long line of like family judges. And he was a really serious guy. And I heard this story from one of his daughters, from from my aunt, and they were sitting. You know, I heard this when I was ten, so this is what sort of got me into the whole UFO thing. And she said they were sitting on their porch in like 1950 as little kids. Wow. And sitting in Scranton, Pennsylvania, out on a front porch. It was, it was just dusk. And it's a quiet little town at the time. And they said this vehicle shot out of the sky. It was about the size of a car, disc shaped. And it hovered, it shot out of the sky like, you know, lightning speed, hovered over a telephone pole and this little contraption came down and grabbed the hold of the uh, of the electrical cable for about three seconds and then it went back up and it was gone again and all of that took about 15 seconds oh wow the whole the whole thing and my grandfather looked at the three girls that he was sitting with and he said i don't know what that was but you can never tell anybody you can never tell anybody what you just saw he goes because the whole town will think we're nuts and they said, wow. Dad, is it a UFO? And he said, I don't know what it was. And he said, but we can never talk about it. And they never talked about it. And, and, and I heard that story you know, later yeah. when I was like 10. And I, you know, I wasn't there. I can't vouch for it. I don't think my aunts were pulling my leg, you know. I, I've since asked them, and they still stand by their story. But when someone you love and is very close with you, tells you a story like that you know it's not like they didn't have the technology back then for the government to be doing test stuff for what they described and you know i just thought you know in all honesty i was like i maybe there's must be something to this you know and there why would why would a gentleman of, of of you know such a stoic nature as you describe why would why would he describe that why would he put that out there why would he you know keep that as, as part of his family when he or make it up when he when he doesn't have to put his family under that sort of pressure i hear that kind of story a lot just average people who after years and years decide to come out and tell a story and it's um I, that's a lot of the proof that you talk about early on that the, that the integrity of these people involved like thousands of stories like that when we were researching this it's not thousands it's like hundreds of thousands of stories mm -hmm. and this the good ones are like you know the credible ones are when it's a cop you know, or like a British, you know, counselor 
who says, not only did I see it, but I could have thrown a brick at it. Like I was that close, you know? Yeah. And so those are the stories, you know, and there's, you know, thousands of those stories. So, you know, as far as like, you know, but there's no proof. It's like, yeah, try to like take a picture of an airplane flying by, you know, it's like, it'll always be a dot in the sky, you yeah, know? Exactly. But I think, you know, you know, I, I'm also, I'm not like, the truth is, I'm really skeptical of it all, you know? I, and, and since I work in visual effects, I never believe anything when I see these videos and pictures mm. because I know how easy it is to fake, you know? But even with that kind of skepticism, uh, a, really, like, a really good way to look at this is you don't have to believe me and you don't have to believe Simon Foster. It's like our governments are now telling us there's something in the sky, they don't know what it is, and they're looking into it. Mm. You know, so don't believe us. Don't believe like, you know, the the person on YouTube. It's like there's now a government, you know, uh, effort that's saying there's something in our skies and we don't know what it is. Yeah. And I think that's not only in the skies but in our seas, in the ocean. Well, that's the fascinating part as well. That's a whole sort of different kind of of uh, visitor that that you know needs to be discussed and needs to be looked at as well. Maybe that's your sequel. Maybe maybe your uh, your teenager goes under the oceans. Well, I think, you know, um, I've worked in the film business a good long time. Uh, I didn't totally intend to start off by making a UFO movie. You know, like, uh, I also, like, I've done a lot of pursuit stuff with GoPros, you know, chasing cars and things. Sure. And I, I really wanted to do this motorcycle apocalyptic chase movie, you know, in the future. But it was so expensive and our funding was always falling through. And a buddy of mine goes, hey, dude, do that alien movie with the kid that you told me about. You know, it'll be easy. He's like, you got GoPros and iPhones. He's like, you don't need a big production. You don't need special cameras. He goes, you can really get great footage. It's all in HD. It's all high definition. He goes, you can take your time with it. You can have a really small little group of, you know, maybe like a lighting guy and a couple of actors. And he goes, and just give that a shot. He goes, yeah. if you're trying to kickstart your career, you know. And and so I'm, I didn't mean to make to become like a UFO spokesman, but it's been fun. A bit, it's yeah. Been fun. We've been getting a lot of emails, like Simon, hundreds of emails from people who have encounters and they don't know who to talk to, but they watch the movie because we've been doing like this test screening on Vimeo. Yeah. You know, we we do that every now and then on Facebook, and then it, you know, maybe like four thousand people have seen it so far, and we've had hundreds of emails of people who don't know who to talk to, like Mufon doesn't answer their emails, so they write us. They're like. This is yeah. what's happening. I don't know what to do about it. You know, yeah, it's exactly. been really interesting. I've got to be honest with you. That's part of the reason I programmed it because there's someone who has that fascination to see the way you portray the inside of the spaceship and the um, and the, the the extraordinary design work and makeup design that you you do to create the aliens. Um, I think when people see this on screen, it's going to be the kind of movie that represents to them what's going on in their minds and what they think it might look like, which is what I want to touch on now the design elements sort of envision envisioning that disorienting inside of, of the ufo of the, of the spaceship um were there a thought process was there a, a design sort of um dream board behind behind putting those together yeah i um i really believe in scouting locations to the death and i really believe in like i'm not great with writing scripts and laying it out like you know uh, with words, but I love design boards. So sort of the way we tackled this was I, you know, just on my own for like a year before I was even going to make this, you know, I, I have design boards for a lot of concepts and I probably did like a 70 page design board, wow. um, um, with 38 scenes. Like when I, when I lured in a couple of the main people who helped me make this, I go, what's the big deal? It's just 38 scenes, you know? We just film like 38 scenes. Each one is like two minutes and then bam, we have a movie. And they're like, yeah, right. But I, I did do a design board and I based it off of like, you know, that research, you know, uh, a lot of people talk about these cylinders filled with like liquid, you yeah. know, that, that sometimes they see humans in or like, or human-esque things in, you know? So I thought like, okay, I've got to do a scene with the cylinders. and. I always was seeing orbs in drawings from alien abductees and I was like, I got to include the orbs. Mm -hmm. And then sometimes there would be small spaces and sometimes there would be these vast spaces, you know? And, um, I just spent my, I just took my time, uh, finding locations and sort of laying this out. And then 
you know, just in the back of my mind before I even thought I would make it. And then when that buddy of mine, who's a director, like he directs TV commercials, he said, dude, do that alien thing. And I had already had a board for it. I already had locations picked out for it. And I thought, uh, so, so yeah, that's how I tackled it. But, you know, I thought it was important. You know, Simon, I want to show a movie where you see everything, where it wasn't just jump scares. Mm -hmm. And I think when some people will watch this, they might get a little frustrated, like, why the F am I, is an alien staring into camera for like 40 seconds? And the answer to that is because, like, when do you ever get to see that in a movie? Like an alien sure. walk right up to camera and just telepathically stare at the person they've abducted, you know? Yeah. And then you really get to observe the alien for like 40 seconds, not like, boom, oh my God, it's an alien. Okay, yeah. it's gone, you know? And it's at the end of the movie. Like in the alien report, right from the start, it's like an alien walks right up to camera, and that's the start of the movie. Mm. And I thought that would be, a, I thought UFO people wanted to see that kind of stuff. I don't know if I'm right or wrong about that, but. Well, I think that's familiar to a lot of UFO buffs and those who follow alien abduction. A lot of them talk about being stood over by different types of aliens and, and, and you know, so that is all part of the quote unquote authenticity of the, the look of the film. Yeah. I thought that was important. I, you know, just for once, you know, I get frustrated with movies and I'm like, oh, I had to watch it for two hours and now I finally see the cool alien scene at the end, you know? Yeah. I thought like, you know, this kid chases the men in black the whole time. He's like, I'm going to take a brick and break out their effing window. He's like, I'm going to find out who's following me. And I thought that was important for the audience, you know, to be able to be taken on this journey, but to like actually get taken on that ride where like you see everything. So, you know, a good chunk of the movie, he's chasing after these cars that are, like, stalking him. And you get to see him, like, run up to him. You get to see him, like, smash out a window. You get to see, like, him interact with whatever it is that comes out. And I thought, you know, we didn't have the budget to, like, go blockbuster huge, you know, with, with a lot of action sequences. But we did have the time to sort of take you on this, like, slow-moving journey uh, and, and get to see like various elements of, you know, of the three part story to, to the UFO story, which is like men in black, telepathic beings and like human hybrids. Mm. So I just thought we would take our time with it and, and sort of just do a slower moving version of, of, of a UFO movie, you know? I, I guess finally, and perhaps most importantly is the person you keep referring to the kid, this, this human face that you put on, the alien abduction experience and the UFO experience. I, I don't think for all the brilliant sort of technical prowess and, and, and makeup work and effects work you show in the film, it doesn't, it wouldn't work without Braxton's central performance and, and the journey he goes through as well. So give, give us a, 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 a bit of praise for your leading man. You know, we wanted the film in really tough neighborhoods in Chicago like the toughest of the tough, just, mm. just to make it different with graffiti and bombed out buildings. And I was originally going to cast this black dude uh, who was out of Detroit and he was so good, you know, he was so good and he had to go away to college because, because we got delayed a couple of months and I got stuck, you know, cause I'd spent a long time trying to find someone really good. And this Braxton showed up at the last second and uh, he sent me like an audition holding his phone at it was midnight when he sent it to me and he was he was a extra in a bunch of like bit TV shows around Chicago and doing like little bit work and he was only 17 or maybe he had just turned 18 but he was a I don't know if I should say this but he was so he's blonde he looks like a California surfer and but he was so good I thought that you know, I go, well, let's hire this kid, but we got to make him look more city tough. So we dyed his hair black. We put some scars on him just to make, just to bring in like the sympathy, you know, like, and, and to create a, 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 a bit of wonder about this character, just so he instantly looks sort of beat up, you know, because I wasn't sure how else to convey that. But I thought he was great. I think because he carries the whole movie and because we didn't have a, a budget to shoot and because he was memorizing lines, you know, uh, you know, last, he had, thank God he had a great memory, but he was memorizing lines, you know, last minute. And we were, and there was a lot of movement to this movie. He was on a bike, he's chasing after cars, he's screaming into the camera. So he had a lot of work to do for a new actor. But what really clinched it was, you know, the first day we were filming, he got a call and he got a full ride to, to an LA college 
a, a full scholarship for acting right. because he had done some auditions for them. So that sort of solidified it for us that we had made the right decision, that it wasn't just us who believed in him, but it was a university who gave him like one of, you know, one of a couple of scholarships to their, to the university. Yeah. I think he was under tremendous pressure and we didn't want someone who was like overacting like, oh my God, you know, the aliens are taking me. Uh. You know, he was, when he, when he said, how should I play this? I said, just, you know, I had seen a kid just like him uh, on Oprah Winfrey years ago. And I go, man, that kid is like got issues. Like he's not very emotional. He's sort of like ice cold. Mm. And I really like that kid's presentation, you know, a real alien abductee. And so, uh, I talked Braxton through that, you know, don't overact this, just, you know, you're doing selfie videos, uh, you're trying not to be embarrassed because if this ever takes off, you know, like in theory, if your friends and family ever see this, like you don't want to come off as like, Ugh, you're like, you want to be sort of cool, you're 18, you know? Yeah. And so I, we had him play it that way. It was safer so that he wouldn't have to act, you know, overact. Sure. And, 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 he's, and he got it, you know, I thought he nailed it, you know, I thought he did a great job. I thought you nailed it, Patrick. I think you've created a film that's going to sit well with with fans of the the UFO and alien abduction genre. I think you've um, created a, a really compelling character arc in in Braxton's journey, and um, I'm hoping that that we can represent the film well down here in Australia. So thank you, mate, for being on the show, and and good luck with the film. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for showing the movie. I know it's a little risky and it's different. Um, and it's so nice to meet you and, uh, and thank you.